Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I would like to look at rocket automation with Clockheed Martin's smart parts. Smart parts are essentially little parts that will provide commands to the rocket under the right situation. So I have these two parts set up in opposite sides of the rocket. On one side, I have a part which will trigger the staging action when uh, it runs out of fuel. And on the other side, I have a timer which will be triggered by the staging action and will wait roughly 60 seconds, or rather it will wait exactly 60 seconds because it's very easy to build something that uh, keeps time, as opposed to a rocket which is a little harder than building something that keeps time. So yeah, this thing, I started it at a slight inclination and I just let gravity turn and the uh, uh, winglets keep it aligned. So what's happened is we've triggered the stage and you see we've got a ballistic trajectory. We're going to carry this across the map here. And on the other side, our uh, timer is counting down. And when that counter hits zero, we're going to stage. And that is our payload. Now, our payload is going into a suborbital trajectory. There is no space probe attached here. There is no command pod attached here. The only command pods were those attached to the launch structure to, g to give the command to launch. So this thing is going to fall back down. Down, and as it descends through the atmosphere, the heat shield will protect it. And once it reaches an altitude of six kilometers, we have another module on board, another part, another smart part, which will trigger the staging action once more. Now, this uh, is the alt altitude based detector. There it goes, triggering the staging action. That will also trigger the parachute. And of course, as we come down, we trigger another timer. And so the parachute opens at about, of course, uh, 500 meters above the surface. And we descend to the surface, land, and now we have about a minute to wait. What are we going to do at the end of that minute? Well, at the end of that minute, we're going to trigger action group one. Action group one will f open up all the science experiments and collect all the scientific data at once so that we can recover it without ever having to committed a space probe to this. So this is what smart parts are all about. They're about programming a mission uh, using these pieces. There's limits to what you can do, but there's actually quite a few interesting things you can accomplish with this. Now, I've also got remote tech installed here, right? Remote tech, if you remember, requires a line of sight, you know, transmitters and everything to point the data in, or to send the data in the correct direction. And what I want to do is try to simulate the Galileo probe and its atmosphere probe. Now, the atmosphere probe was dropped into Jupiter's atmosphere, wherein it, uh, it endured the most horrific re-entry conditions, burning off something like half of its heat shield mass and enduring 250 Gs. Now, to get this working with remote tech, what we have here is a couple of, uh, well, we have three different altitude triggers. At one altitude, we're going to ditch the heat shield and the, the casing, the fairings. Then at the next one, we're going to deploy the parachute. And finally, when we are moving slowly enough, we will actually deploy the antenna. If you look in the top left, the we have no connection back to base. So we have no way to send back any scientific data we might collect. With remote tech, the folding antenna have a nasty habit of getting torn off by aerodynamic forces if they're deployed when you are moving too quickly. So this is why we have the timers and the altitude controls. Once we're moving slow enough, we will deploy an antenna and therefore establish the uplink and hopefully we will actually be able to collect the data. Anyway, my plan didn't quite work out because what happened was the fairing started to overheat a little. The fairing on top, the heat shield apparently was fine. In fact, the heat shield never showed anything, but yes, fire, 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 and explosions. But that's all in the day's work for a Kerbal, so we weren't too phased by that. Thankfully, deadly re-entry isn't attempting to model radiative heating uh, past or be, you know, behind the heat shield. Otherwise, things would be really bad. But yeah, there you can see me uh, highlighting the various timer or various altitude triggers. There's three of them. One goes at 40 kilometers, one goes at 30, and the last one goes at 25. So here is the first one. 
Bingo, we ditch the heat shield, and as soon as we drop that, we decelerate very quickly because the heat shield was actually the most massive thing on the spacecraft. The same was true of Galileo's atmosphere probe. It apparently, uh, had, it was something like 250 kilograms, and uh, over half of it was ablated off by the intense heat of re-entry. So yeah, we just passed 30 kilometers, we deployed the parachute, and of course, when we get down to the next altitude limit, we will be able to deploy the antenna. Actually, at this altitude, we were probably go going slow enough that I could actually deploy the antenna safely. But uh, I guess I was just guesstimating these numbers when I put this, put this program together. Now, these are all discrete parts. I'm also using the action groups expanded, which gives you way more action groups. And when you combine these parts, you can actually make some really interesting stuff happen because, of course, one action group can trigger a timer, which can then trigger another action group and so on and so forth. There we are. We deployed the antenna and we transmit our, and we collected all the science as well. So we're ready to transmit there and we have a little green light telling us that we have a, an uplink through the other spacecraft, through the mothership that deployed this. So yeah, we can uh, send that data home and we have completed our important science mission thanks to these timers. All that's left is to let this thing fall to the surface. It has lost contact because the spacecraft has moved over the horizon and the parachute deploys with uh, quite alarming force, apparently knocking it upwards at 500 kilometers per second. Okay, so... The third thing that we have is Radio Gaga. Radio Gaga is a way to link multiple spacecraft and replicate the actions here. So, what a perfect excuse to try some formation flying. Okay, it's not really going to be formation flying. This is the best formation we're going to start out in. So there, we pull back and they also try to pull back. Uh, except that I pull in my landing gear and they don't. They look rather close together. I hope they don't crash into each other because that would be really terrible. It really is quite embarrassing that they are keeping better formation than me. Obviously, I'm using the rapier engine on this because that's the, the only jet-style engine that has a rear attachment node on it, so you can attach it in front and behind. Better pull up to get out of that dive there. Let's just go over the top and try to get everyone going in a different direction. Whoa, what the heck happened there? So yeah, the, the spacecraft or the aircraft are trying to match heading. They are of course dealing with their own physics, there is a bit of lag, which means they will slowly end up getting further and further apart. Well, you know, odds of you being able to keep them in close formation is pretty remote. Uh, but there are many other applications that make far more sense. In particular, if you're in space and, and flying a constellation of spacecraft, that matters more. Let's uh, chase after this one here. It is pulling on ahead, and it, I've just realized that I have no throttle control, so this thing is now going... If, if I turn too hard, this thing is very likely to tear itself apart. Let, Oh yes, well, so much for that. I thought I was going to be able to gently slow that down. Well, uh, the good news is that I am now actually catching up on the debris. I think I'll just throttle back a little while we uh, while we figure out what's left of this spacecraft, uh, this little aircraft. I, oh, I just flung a bu bunch of wings on there, to be honest. It's not the best. Oh hey, look, we actually have some uh, we have something that's flyable. If only I had mounted the fuel duct on it to let me dump fuel, that would make a little more sense. So this is trying to fly. Uh, of course, I'm realizing this is now sending commands to that other aircraft. Actually, it seems that I have some control here. Now, the only thing is I think I'm losing altitude too quickly. So maybe if I can just try to keep this going. I don't know how to... Oh, dear. Yep, yeah, so much for that. Well, it's dead. Let's just try landing this parent. Because, uh, yeah, I've launched this aircraft once, and being able to land it, well, of course, uh, that's part of the fun, isn't it? So there's the island runway. Okay, I mean, I wouldn't be going for a landing if the island runway wasn't just there. 
So the only thing is I think I'm moving a little too fast here and I'm not bleeding off speed quickly enough so I'm going to do some hard stalls here. In a stall condition, a wing's drag increases by a great deal and its lift tends to drop off. So of course you can purposely stall the wings on some aircraft to slow yourself down. It is a very stupid thing to do. Do not try this at home. Okay, we're coming in and I still think I'm going too fast on account of these wings being too skinny and too narrow. And it's just wobbling around like that. Okay, come on, try to touch the ground and start braking here. Touch the ground, I think I am not... Oh, 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 turn that way, turn that way. No, no, turn that way now. No, okay. And we're down. Well, let's go on and take a look at one more miracle of automation. Okay, so what we have here is an attempt to replicate the Japanese Lambda rockets. Now, the Lambda rockets are... Uh, they're almost unique, I believe. They are the only rockets that have ever launched orbital payloads using entirely unguided launch vehicles. Now, they were multi-stage solid rocket boosters. Early on, they used aerodynamics and gravity turn to basically uh, turn the thing over. So I've started this at a very slight angle and I'm just letting gravity pull me down here. All I've done here is hit space. Now, the first stage, I've set the thrust so it doesn't accelerate too quickly, which means it's getting pulled down. We're about the 45 degree mark. Now, we're starting to rotate because on the outside of the second stage, we have a couple of Sepatron motors, and those are angled, and those are actually starting to force the rotation. But the wings are really the main thing here for keeping it straight. Okay, so as soon as we hit zero fuel, the... Uh, the system fires my stage automatically and now the second stage is running so we have sepatrons on there the sepatrons have had their thrust dialed back to about eight percent so they don't burn out in in a few seconds they're gonna last a whole lot longer in fact they should last just about as long as the main engine here you can see that we're spinning so quickly that the fairing is actually splitting obviously a real fairing would designed to do that. Look at the fire on this thing. Man, we're starting to look like a Sprint missile here. Sprint missile, if you don't know, was an anti-ballistic missile system developed by the US, which accelerated up to Mach 10 in about 10 seconds. It would glow white hot with the heat of the atmosphere. Okay, so we're about to burn out and we're getting a little unstable. We have activated the timer for stage deployment here, but hopefully we will end up in an orbit or in a, in a trajectory that takes us outside the atmosphere. So there's a timer from the uh, end of that stage to the, to there we go, to the stage separation. Now the satellite is flying free. And the satellite is of course still, uh, it still hasn't deployed anything. It has an altimeter on it that when I reach 75 kilometers, it will trigger the deployment of the antenna and the solar panels. And from that point, we will have control. So the final stage on these Lambda rockets were actually, they did have some sort of control to make sure that they could angle their rocket motors exactly along the, uh, along the orbit. In my case, I'm not gonna do that because I think, let me just see. Yeah, so by the time we get around there, we will be below the horizon of the base station and the satellite that is also in, uh, is currently in orbit is in the wrong position. I should have probably waited to launch until that satellite is in the correct location. So yeah, I'm gonna go outwards a bit. I'm gonna fly away from Kerbin just so I get a bit higher. And then once I'm up here, I'm going to point my my spacecraft downwards and arrest my ascent velocity and circularize the orbit. It is not the most efficient way to get into orbit, but I think I will have enough here just to put a little satellite into orbit. So I'm bringing down the Apple apps and uh, hopefully when the Apple apps is equal to my current altitude, I will be in a circular orbit. If not, um, actually I don't think that's going to happen. I'm going to need to control it just a little more. I'm going to need to give it a little more lateral velocity to make sure. I hope I don't run out of fuel. 
Yes, excellent. Applications of automation. And this is very simple automation. I was originally going to look at Kerbal operating system, but I figured that this is a simpler first step for people that want to start looking at things like this. So yeah, check it out. It is a Smart Parts by Clockheed Martin. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <music> you.